Well, Shavua Tov, everyone. Um, uh, I'm super excited about uh, tonight's program uh, and to introduce our program uh, and uh, tell you a little bit about how tonight will go. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, ask Abraham Tester, who's the head of our special programs committee, to say a few words. Oh, Abraham, you're muted. Hey, no. Hang on, let me try something. Oh, Abraham, sorry, do it one more time. There I you go. I think I've got it now. You do. Okay. Uh, again, thank you, Rabbi, and thank you, Jessica, for just a beautiful Havdalah service. Your voice enriches everything. Sometimes you get lucky. The Havdalah Programming Committee developed this series of programs through email. Itamar, among several others, accidentally received one of those notes. Please don't ask me how. I know Itamar's sterling musical reputation. So when I received his gracious response volunteering to do a program for CCI, I nearly fell off my seat. Itamar is from Tel Aviv but currently lives right here in Athens with his family. He is a prize-winning violin soloist who has been featured by the Atlanta Symphony, the Israel Philharmonic, and the German Radio Philharmonic. He has, he has played under the baton of Valery Gergiev, Zubin Meir, and Michael Tilson Thomas. Recently, he is visiting guest artist at the Eastman School of Music. Jewish liturgical and folk music has been around for a long time, but it wasn't until the late 18th century that it began to find its way into what we all think of as quote, classical music. Tonight, through narrative and music, Itamar will tell at least part of this story. I know that there will be a number of questions. Please ask your questions as they occur to you via the chat function on your screen. Rabbi Linder will be monitoring the questions. At the end of Itamar's presentation, he will, like, he will ask at least some of the questions that have been submitted via the chat function. And with that introduce, introduction, I'm turning it over to Itamar. Okay, thank you, Abraham. Um, everyone can hear me, right? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, and also to thank you to Rabbi Linder. I'm really excited to be here. Some of you I already know, some of you I don't, and I hope to <laughs> see you in person, hopefully not in too long. Uh, yes, yeah, so we titled this concert slash presentation um, Jewish themes in classical music. So that raises two questions. First of all, what is classical music? And secondly, what are Jewish themes or Jewish music? I'm not even gonna uh, uh, <laughs> address the second one, the uh, what is classical music. In terms of what is Jewish music, well, uh, this, uh, it's like asking uh, what does it mean to be Jewish? There are so many answers. So what I thought I would do is, is just go through a few possible answers a uh, few possible uh, different streams of Jewish music that influenced classical composers uh, to write pieces today for the violin. Um, and we'll start right away with some music. I will play uh, a piece by composer Joseph Achron. Uh, Achron was originally from St. Petersburg, uh, Russia, e eventually immigrated to the United States, to California, and he even uh, worked in Hollywood for a little bit. And this is his most well-known piece. It's called the Hebrew Melody. It's based on um, um, a synagogue tune that he heard uh, in Poland. At first, he quotes it in its original form, and then it it, it develops into quite a quite a tumultuous um, climax. Eventually, it comes back with a real sense of looking back um, of, of a memory more than the actual 
melody itself. It's a wonderful piece. I hope you'll enjoy it.
the pitch. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this was Joseph Akron and um, uh, Akron was a part of uh, an organization called the Society for Jewish Folk Music that was operating in St. Petersburg in the beginning of the 20th century, I think before the communist revolution. Uh, and their mission was to create a Jewish national style of music, the same way that around that time they were developing uh, all those other nations in Europe. They had their own style. Let's say if you listen to the music of someone like Dvořák, it sounds Czech because he, he implements the music of his country. Same with Russian music, uh, German, Hungarian, you name it. So they wanted to create a Jewish one, a Jewish style, and to do that they do, did some field work, like this piece by Akron. Actually, I think it, this is, I, I could show you this, this is, I think, quite nice. He recorded this piece first, well, he recorded the original in a synagogue, and as you can see, hopefully here, let's see if that works. I'm going to try to share screen, and let's see if it works. Okay, so this is the original edition of this piece and what I really like about it is that the title is in Yiddish and this is something you never see uh, in classical music. But you see it uh, to the memory of uh, my father, uh, he wrote it, and then original version of the melody in this transcription as recorded by the author. So he went to the synagogue in Poland and you see in the, the sort of the smaller prints, that's the original melody that he quotes, and then he incorporates it into the actual composition. Um, the most famous example of someone doing that, by the way, is wasn't by someone Jewish, it's Max Bruch's Kol Nidre. That's a very, very famous piece, and you hear it often on, on Yom Kippur, but, uh, um, well, he was, I guess, yeah, I'll stop now. Uh, Bruch was introduced, well, you probably know, it goes like this. Uh, <laughs> introduced to that melody uh, by the cantor of the Neue Synagogue, the uh, Reform uh, Synagogue in Berlin. His name was Liechtenstein, and following that, he, uh, he wrote that piece. Interestingly, that's really trivia, but the musical director of that synagogue in Berlin wrote a piece for violin and piano using the exact same tune, I think, 15, mi uh, 15 years before Bruch. His name was uh, Louis Lewandowski, a very important um, person in Jewish music, music uh, history. Uh, anyway, so this is one way to introduce Jewish themes, is to actually take a religious theme and insert it. Uh, the other option is to try to imitate chazanut or cantorial singing, and this is what uh, composer Ernst Bloch tries to do in the piece that I will play for you now. Bloch was originally from Switzerland, although he immigrated to the US and then had a major role here he was the director of the Cleveland Institute of Music, San Francisco Conservatory, taught at the University of California, Berkeley, and started festivals. But he is a major composer, not only of um, Jewish sort of influenced music, but in one of his most beloved works is the Baal Shem Suite. He described it as uh, three pictures of, from Hasidic life. I will play the second one, a Nigun. It's a religious... Uh, song again very much associated with the Hasidic movement and speaking of the Hasidic movement I thought uh, it would be nice to read a couple of quotes from Rabbi Nachman of Breslau uh, one of the founders of Hasidic Judaism and because they really thought very highly of the role of music in this sort of spiritual connection I guess to God uh, more than the traditional sort of more learned um, streams of Judaism and, and he writes for example through song calamities can be removed or music originates from the prophetic spirit and has the power to elevate one to prophetic inspiration so Bloch really takes this idea uh, for this piece to create a sense of exaltation through 
uh, imitating cantorial singing. And what does that mean? First of all, the music is not rhythmic. It doesn't really conform to one, two, three, four, which I guess is, is very much like this cantillation, the reading of the Bible, uh, even from older times. Secondly, the key is minor, even in the Havdalah uh, 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 service that we heard today, which Jessica sang, uh, sang beautifully, all the songs were in minor. And this is something that's common to really Jewish communities across the globe, uh, Sephardic, Ashkenazi. But he, the one twist is that while it starts in minor, what is very sort of Ashkenazi is that it ends which is the scale called the Ahava Rabba, um, Abundant Love, um, which is just the most uh, sort of soulful uh, scale. You hear it in Havanagila. It's this scale. Um, so there, there is that, and very, a lot of ornamentation. Um, revolving around one note, trying to find a way out. This is also very, like a chazan, <laughs> a cantor, tutorial singing. So, uh, this is uh, Nigun from Bloch's Falsche. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this was Bloch. Um, another possibility is to deal with sort of Jewish themes and Jewish texts, but use music that's actually not coming from the Jewish world. And I wanted to show you a, a video of, of such an example of, of which I particularly uh, love. It's a piece by Leonard Bernstein. Uh, Bernstein was actually occupied with Jewish themes throughout his life. Well, you know, he lived through the 20th century and uh, the Jewish condition was on his mind. Often he played, after World War II, I think he played a concert in a concentration camp with survivors. Uh, he was instrumental in the uh, beginnings of the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. And he wrote uh, three symphonies. The first is about Jeremiah, the prophet. Um, the third is called Kaddish. It's like an argument, uh, a discussion, or more, or more of an argument, really, uh, with God. And he has a piece that's called Chichester Psalms. Psalms, it's um, where the music, it deals, of course, with Psalms. It's sung in Hebrew. Uh, but the musical style is much more reminiscent of West Side Story. And the second movement is um, uh, features the very famous psalm, I think it's 23, um, Lord is my shepherd, Adonai Ori, I, I have the text here. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me uh, beside quiet waters. Uh, it's a famous one. And Bernstein's um, I guess rendition tries to, I, th I guess, evoke um, sort of <laughs> young King David, I guess, uh, um, playing the violin, or back then it was closer to a harp, because he uses for this piece a boy soprano um, and a harp. Uh, let me show you this video we ha I have here. Um, Bernstein himself conducting. This is with an orchestra in Poland, the, the voice always sings wonderfully. His name is uh, Marcus Bauer. Um, so that the piece starts very, very peacefully with this psalm, and then it um, transitions very, very suddenly uh, to uh, another psalm. Um, uh, I think it's number two. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? And you'll hear this really sounds like West Side Story once this happens. So first there'll be a couple minutes of the sort of more lyrical boy soprano singing. So, ah, no, but I didn't do it correctly because I really should um, make sure that you can actually hear this. Okay, now it should work. Okay, so this is teaches the Psalms. Let me know if you can't hear. <laughs>
So you, you get the idea. It's wonderful, wonderful music. The whole piece really is. Um, and uh, yeah, the voice soprano is Young King David, I think, yeah. Works very, very nicely. Uh, let's see, uh, starting to run short of time. Um, one more, I guess, stream of this kind of, uh, again, we, we haven't even, even touched yet, is the Sephardic Jews. This was mostly I guess Ashkenazi or you know in Europe Eastern Europe and the US um, when composers I guess when Israel was founded composers there really wanted to try to recreate sort of the biblical uh, style they would and it, it's impossible to know <laughs> what that was but they assumed quite right probably correctly that it was closer to the music of the region so they turned to um, the music of the Jewish communities from the, the, the region, the uh, Egyptian, Turkish, Yemenite. Uh, and that influenced their musical language greatly. A very influential figure in that was the singer slash ethnomusicologist Bracha Tzfira. She was a, a performer who um, collected tunes from synagogues all over Jerusalem. And then she asked composers to write music for her based on these songs. Um, one of these composers was Paul Ben Chaim, who was originally from Germany, but after hearing her, he changed his style completely, and he started writing in what was called the Mediterranean style, uh, where the scales are much closer to Arabic music. Um, and I wanted to play one very quick, uh, rather virtuosic piece by Paul Benheim to give you an idea. This is called, the, this is an etude um, for solo violin. And as you see, uh, the, the, it, it imitates a little bit the kanun, this kind of Arabic instrument. Uh, and the scales are again, uh, are quite different. Goes like this. <laughs> In a very short time span. Um, other options are um, music inspired by klezmer. There's a certain, there's a particular piece they wanted to show. Perhaps afterwards, if we have time, I, I could show a little bit of this. Um, it's a trio for violin, clarinet, and piano by an American composer called Paul Schoenfield, uh, teaches at the University of Michigan. Uh, now klezmer, as, as you probably know. Uh, usually music for celebrations, weddings, came from Eastern Europe. Um, and the great thing about klezmer is its adaptability. So uh, in Eastern Europe, they include all sorts of Eastern European melodies. And in the US, there's a lot of jazz. And his piece has both. Um, and it's quite virtuosic. I might show it a little bit later. Um, but I did want to uh, I'll leave you with some more music uh, that's very close to home for me because it was written for my by my father, uh, Moshe Zomal. And this one is based on a very, very famous tune, uh, Jerusalem of Gold. 
think you might be familiar with that. And uh, so you'll see what, what he does with it. It's a little, I guess, fantasy on the on the song, I think, but you'll recognize it, I'm sure. And afterwards, I'd be very happy to take questions.
Thank you. So, yeah, I'm very much open to questions right now, if anyone had. Well, Itamar, thank you so much. My gosh, that uh, amazing. I think we could listen to you for, for hours um, between the teaching and playing. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your violin? Uh, yeah. Uh, the violin, yeah. It's on loan to me <laughs> by a high-tech person um, from Israel, in fact, with an amateur violinist composer. Uh, and he, uh, he has a nice instrument collection, and he started a decade ago giving some of those instruments on loan to some younger musicians. And I was very lucky to have this one. This is a Guarneri violin uh, from 1734. Guarneri um, was the big rival of Stradivarius. They lived more or less around the same time. And they ended up being the two main models for violin making so if you see for example violins made today it's most likely they would be either a strad so a very small model or a guarneri model they were very very influential so this is a guarneri and then uh someone asked I, I don't know what the piece was in comparison but um there was a piece after you played the hasidic piece i think that it struck that the next piece was very different and so the question is, is there an official Jewish style of music in Israel? And uh, which style does have the most influence? Yes, uh, that's a good question. I think nowadays it's just uh, everything goes, I guess. There, there was back um, towards uh, around the sort of uh, the establishment of the, well, I guess when the country was established, this sort of style that's Middle Eastern Mediterranean, trying to find um, yeah, music sort of uh, in the region as a source of in inspiration was very, very common. So like those con con composers from St. Petersburg tried to create a national Jewish style, the Israeli ones tried to create an Israeli style and trying to look back at biblical times. This sort of uh, eventually uh, fade a little bit. It, it got a little out of fashion, I would say. It became everything became more international. But I think it, it's making somewhat of a comeback uh, in recent years. Yeah. Rabbi. Yes, sir. Maybe we could take one more questions, and perhaps Itamar will do the klezmer thing he's ah, talking about. Yeah. It, it's a recording, uh, and not, it's not just me playing. It's uh, so it's it's not. Uh, I could show it, but it's not. Uh, it's not just me. Okay. Uh, but 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 thanks. <laughs> well, Itamar, I I also I I happen to know um, a few people in the Klezmer band. I'm I'm in the Klezmer band here. Um, yeah. And uh, when when it's uh, safe for us all to play again, I I think it's fair to uh, to speak for the band that we'd love to have you uh, play with us and 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 perhaps pick some songs. And I know members uh, on here would enjoy that as well. That would be phenomenal. That would be fun, yes. But is there, are there any, is there any uh, last question that anyone has before uh, Itamar shows us that video? When did he first play the violin? Okay. So, I started playing violin when I was six years old. Um, first, I, I started um, in called the Suzuki method. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's basically in a group, a uh, group of kids, but lots of it, it becomes also a social thing. It's a lot of fun. You, you start by uh, playing from ear, and only then you start uh, you learn reading notes, uh, which is an interesting concept, uh, you know, the pros and cons. Uh, but it was lots of fun, that's for sure. I became really serious about it around the age of 14. That's where sort of I decided this might be a career path. <laughs> I didn't think in, the, in these terms back then, but the, like this is something I wanted to do when I grew up. Okay. 
Okay, any more questions? I can show that, that piece by Paul Schoenfield. Um, it's, um, these are four movements. I'll play just the beginning of the first. Uh, and they, he gives them very, very uh, klezmer titles. The first one is Freilach, so this is like a, <laughs> past, uh, like a muse, um, wedding dance, then a march. Again, it is a very Hasidic, um, in a Hasidic court. Third is a Negro, and the last one is a uh, Kosatsky. I guess that's a Eastern European dance. And what's interesting about this piece, uh, first of all, both the instrumentation, violin, clarinet, piano, this is really a sort of textbook Eastern European, except for the piano. I guess in Eastern Euro Europe, they would have maybe like a bass and a dulcimer, some sort of, um, yeah, another instrument that could, pro could provide harmony, the chords. Um, and you know, when I was, I was preparing for this, I read a little bit about Klezmer. It's interesting that it's always, it was restricted to smaller groups and one reason was actually the religious authorities, the Jewish religious, religious authorities, they didn't want too much happiness. They want to, you know, because the, the temple was dead, was destroyed, and they thought, uh, you know, it's better to minimize <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the happiness and the celebrating. So we, we, would, we would have, you know, three, four, five musicians, not more than that. So this is one of the reasons Klezmer, I guess, um, developed the way it did. So now I will show this little clip. So this one is really, um, I guess, a mix between Eastern European klezmer, jazz. You'll hear there's a little piano solo close to the beginning. It's very jazzy and classical. So I'll play just a couple minutes for this. The, the name of the composer is Paul Schoenfield. Um, yes. Okay, as you can hear it is You'll notice me with way less hair playing the violin and Maxim and Vadim Londo uh, playing the piano and clarinet. You get the idea um, from this piece, and uh, the other movements are also uh, quite exciting. <laughs> 